Okay, uh, welcome to the first of two sessions this week for week four. Yes, we are in week four, so we can see the end in sight. Um, so yay for that. Um, today's session is probably, I don't know, I haven't timed it, but it might be a little bit on the shorter end because it's week four and because I really only have kind of one key topic to go over today, which is copyright. Um, in Thursday's session, I will be more of a a goodbye or closing for the course as well as a reminder of what assignments you need to be completing in order to finish the course but we're kind of uh, reaching the finish line here so today's focus is really just on the issue of copyright because this is going to be a topic that we're going to cover this week um, it's an important topic um, while I'm speaking if the four of you so that's uh, Alexander, Jason, Jonathan and Tarina if you could go ahead and type in the chat box your areas some of them I remember I think Tarina's is music related I think Jonathan's is computer related somehow but just so that the other members can remember um, okay so Jonathan is game design Jason is graphic design okay good Alexander music production okay Alexander so today's stuff will be I mean it's going to be important for all of you because I think copyright affects all of your industries uh, but yeah music is always is always a big one and Tarina as well M music production okay so there's proof right I mean all four industries you just listed um, fall pretty seriously under copyright laws um, for Jason graphic design can sometimes touch on that and it can sometimes if it's for the business side of things apply more to like trademark issues uh, but all four of those areas are, are massively covered by copyright music perhaps getting the most attention for this because it's a battle that continues to be ongoing and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit a little bit later so since all of you are here at Full Sail University pursuing these degrees that are leading to the entertainment industry and I use entertainment industry in the broadest terms possible so we may not think of the video game industry as strictly being the, the entertainment industry but it is right I mean it's creative it's artistic um, it's aimed at providing hours of leisure and relaxation and a whole lot of fun um, graphic design I tend to look at that as probably more of a I don't want to say more serious because the other fields are serious as well but um, you might not think it automatically applies to the entertainment business, but it can. Um, but it's it's certainly also a, a creative field that that draws upon artistic ability. So because all of you are in these fields that are creative, and many of you are heading directly toward careers in the entertainment industry, the issue of copyright is like super important. Um, and that's why we cover it in this class. This is why you'll get a more in-depth examination probably later in your, your degree fields. The music production people, certainly. I would like to think that graphic design has to be has to touch on this later as well. Um, I don't know how big of an issue in game design copyright is. I don't I mean I don't know I'm sure it exists, but I'm not sure if it's like a hot topic the way it is in, in other fields like like music. Or, or, or in graphic design where you can't just grab stuff that isn't yours and, 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 and pass it off as, as your company's logo. Um, but probably a lot of you will get some more in-depth information later in your programs, but we'll cover the, the kind of basics here. It's something we like to stress. Um, it's something we stress again in month four. If you see me again as your English instructor, um, it's kind of a big deal. We, we try to teach students to respect copyright. Okay, so here's what we're going to go over in this session. Uh, first, just an examination of copyright, what it is. Uh, then we'll get into, into issues of fair use, because fair use is a term that we hear all the time, and we see it a lot, but not everybody truly knows what it means. Uh, I don't mean to generalize, but sometimes I see students who think that fair use just means, oh, there's eight seconds or you know five seconds from that Rihanna song. I'm going to use it, because I'm not using the whole song that's fair use uh, no probably not um, the fair use has very very specific guidelines so I, uh, I'll talk about that and then we'll get into some of the other stuff terms you should just be aware of like Creative Commons uh, royalty free which isn't free <laughs> and public domain which is free so that will be some interesting stuff to go over, like what really is free out there and what isn't. Uh, then we'll wrap things up with any questions that people might have. And feel free to use the chat box or 
raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, by the way, let me back up for just a second and say that how did everybody's uh, project for last week go with the Hurricane Sandy um, and the examination of social media? I hope it wasn't too rough. There's a ton of information out there on on Hurricane Sandy. Did feel did people feel mostly uh, comfortable with that assignment? <laughs> Jonathan says he's busy almost busy almost didn't get to it on time. Yeah, that happens. I've been there. Uh I've been there as a student sometimes waking up the morning something was due and rushing to get it done. Not saying that that's a good good uh, strategy, but these things happen. Yeah, Tarina, like all these assignments, I think there's a lot of things to juggle, but I don't think the assignments themselves are... I mean, yeah, they do require effort. I'm not saying that they don't, but um, it can seem like a lot, especially if you mean that there's a lot of information to sort through online. Yeah, there, there's probably a ton that's written on on Hurricane Sandy. Okay, so here's kind of our working definition of copyright, uh, or actually it's just kind of more of a description of what you should do in order to get something copyrighted. Most people kind of know what copywriting is. It's it's protection of material that you create. Um, and anything that you do create, if you want to have it copyrighted, it has to be proper, properly registered through the Copyright Office for a fee. I think that fee is something like I don't know. I should have checked before I went online. There's always something I forget to check. But I think it's like $50 or something. Um, and if you pay that fee, it's officially copyrighted. Okay, and you can do that for anything. I mean, you know, I'm not sure why you would copyright maybe a horrible, god-awful poem that you wrote and you know that it's awful. But if you really think it's that important to be protected, you can officially get it copyrighted. Uh, however, if you make changes to the work... Uh, you know, which is an official, which is officially a change to that original copyright. You'll have to copyright it again. And of course, any time that we use copyrighted material without permission, that's called infringement. So when you look at like famous uh, court cases, like there was one in the early 1990s involving uh, Two Live Crew that went all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, right? That was a case that was that that involved infringement. In that case, which maybe I'll, I'll return to that example later because I, I want to save the music-related stuff for later. But in that case, Two Live Crew, you've all heard of that group, right? They got a lot of attention. Even if you're young, you probably recognize that name. Uh, they had sort of borrowed um, not just the, the language. The language was actually parodied, but the, the language and music of the Roy Orbison song, Pretty Woman, right? We all know that song. It's a super famous song. Um, in one of their hits, I can't remember the name of that. That's the Two Live Crew song, actually. But um, but that case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it sided with Two Live Crew. Um, later, we'll talk about how recent court court cases haven't been always going that great. Uh, but that was kind of a surprise because the the legal system has been quite vigorous in terms of defending people's copyright laws. So. Um, yeah, there was an example of a, a case involving infringement. Uh, oh, and just some real quick things. Uh, sometimes people have heard of these, although maybe we're getting to the point where these are old-fashioned things that nobody remembers, but it used to be that there were a couple myths <clears throat> that sort of circulated out there. These were sort of the equivalent of, I don't know, urban legends or just bad advice that had been passed from person to person. One was this idea of an eight second rule, meaning that if you just sampled something but it was limited to eight seconds, you were fine. Um, that's not true. As a matter of fact, uh, um, just recently, I, I forget which case it was, but it's, it was within the last couple of years. I mean, the court ruled in one case that even, for example, like three notes strung together can, can constitute uh, infringement. Okay, I, th I think the eight-second rule came about because of something I'll, I'll present in another slide, which is that if you do claim fair use, it has to be limited in scope. For example, you're not just taking the whole piece, you're just taking part of the piece under fair use, which I know I'm getting ahead of myself, we haven't defined fair use yet. So I think there's this mistaken belief that, oh, if, as long as we're not sampling the whole thing, we're just taking a few seconds. That's fine, and that's that's actually completely not true. Um, 
And related to that is the urban legend or just bad advice of the, the poor man's copyright. This is less of an issue now because so few of us use snail mail to do things. But there used to be a common belief, and I actually had a professor who taught us this, and when, when I found out later that was completely wrong, I, I was angry. But in the, the old days, the idea was, okay, this applies to things on paper, by the way. So, for example, a song that you've written, but it's written down maybe in musical note form, right, notation. Or maybe it's a set of lyrics, or maybe it's a short story that you wrote, or maybe it's, I don't know, just you know a painting, a drawing, what have you that if you put it in an envelope, sealed it, and then mailed it to yourself, the envelope would come to you, date, you know, time stamped, right? Date stamped or postmarked, that's the word I'm looking for, postmarked as proof that hey, this really does belong to me because look, here's an unsealed envelope that contains uh, what I created and it's a, and you can see this because it has this date on it. Well, that doesn't hold up in a co in a court of law, unfortunately. Right? It seems pretty clever. It seems like pretty solid evidence, but it, it, ju it just doesn't hold up. Like I said, I think today with snail mail, not too many people try that. But every so often, you'll, I don't know, you'll hear about some some person who thinks they're being clever. Um, oh, Charina says you'll have to tell your mom that. <laughs> yeah, she, you know that legend from her. I don't know. I mean, maybe it has limited functionality in, tr in terms of trying to scare off someone who really does try to steal your song or steal your you know they might not know they might not have the legal advice that's telling them you know that that won't hold up in court um so maybe it has limited value in that sense but yeah you if you want your copyright to be ironclad in court you need to you basically need to pay that 50 bucks and and have it copyrighted okay so this is kind of stuff that you pro probably know but here's like a list of stuff that is copyrightable uh, oh, Alexander provided the link. Uh, Alexander, if you if you can do it for us, if if it if it's easy to find, because I know sometimes on those government pages, there's 10 million words, but it's difficult to find the information. Does it say how much the the fee is? Uh, but anyway, here are copyrightable will work. So right, literary stuff, novels, poems, articles, and even software. Um, I could be wrong, but, the, but in the last kind of uh, version of copyright law, software actually got covered under the literary thing just because software is written in code, and code is language. And even though it's not a language that we necessarily sit down and read the way we do re read other things, it's covered under this category. Um, music, right? We all know that. Songs, jingles, beats, it depends, okay? Beats are kind of in that weird category where if the beat is recognizable enough or if it's truly someone's recognizable creation it can be it can be covered other times it's 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 in that kind of gray area um, anything that's dramatic so plays performances musicals opera notice in this case it's more for the performance itself and the story itself so music that's used within a music musical might also be copyrighted as songs um, but here it's for the the entire kind of performance uh, Jonathan says, is there a maintenance fee for copyrights? Do you mean, what does that mean? Like, to keep it ongoing? It's it's a one-time fee, if I can remember correctly, that just needs to be renewed if you make changes to the work. Um, uh, but other things that you might not think about, like choreography, can be technically copywritten if your dance is so signature that it deserves protection um, other things that are graphical in nature so pictures that could be you know paintings but it could also be uh, drawings comic book stuff uh, photos um, graphics depending on the nature of the graphics it can be um, covered and obviously things like sculptures right so we're looking at lots of things that are basically people's original creations um, sound recordings this is different than songs in the sense that um, sometimes there are specific recordings of people delivering speeches or lectures or in the old days before television uh, radio was a popular format and there were actual radio dramas that you could listen to on the air um, so these sorts of things are covered by sound recordings and you all know probably motion pictures and television uh, here's a list of stuff that is not copyrightable although as I mentioned in the final bullet here 
Um, some of these things are, are protected in different ways, like trademarks and patents. Um, trademarks, in some ways, are kind of the business, or the I should say, the commercial world's equivalent of the copyright, right? So when you look at things like the Coca-Cola uh, slow, uh, slogan, or uh, not just slogan, but what's the word I'm looking for? The logo, right? That that familiar cursive script that Coca-Cola is always written in, or the Nike swoosh, or the Apple symbol, right? For for Mac products, um, those things are protected in their own very very specific ways, but they're not called copyrights; they're called trademarks. Um, and of course, patents are just um, protection for original ideas, typically inventions that you've 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 come up with or new techniques. Uh, but t typically, here are the things that are not copyrightable, uh, like names. You know, your name isn't protected, right? Anybody can anybody can use it, but. Uh, there are issues of libel and slander if you don't use it appropriately, but there's nothing that protects your name or any name from, from never being used. Uh, same thing for titles. You might not think so, but I bet if you think long and hard enough, and I'm, I'm embarrassed I didn't think of a good example before I came in today, but like, haven't you noticed songs that have the same title, but they're written by different people? They're not cover versions. It's just two people happen to write a song um, with the exact same title right like i'm sure there must be i don't know 10 million songs out there called you're mine or <laughs> or love right so uh titles uh are not copyrighted even when the title is kind of original actually this is this is a terrible example because it's not one you any of you can relate to but uh the beatles had a famous record called let it be and then in the 1980s this punk group came out with an album called let it be and it was intentional, right? Like, why not take one of the most famous records by the most famous, one of the most famous bands on the planet and use it purposely to sort of point out that, you know, it's a sort of ironic reuse of the title. And they were allowed to do it, right? Nobody said, hey, the Beatles came up with Let It Be. You can't dare use that, that title. So titles are not uh, copyrightable. Uh, short phrases... Uh, slogans again. Some of this stuff can be covered under under trademark. So if it's a very very specific slogan uh, associated with a, a product, um, so a real famous not famous, but it got some news attention maybe about a year ago was you know Chick Fil A, right? They have those commercials with "Eat more chicken." The joke is supposed to be the cows uh, can't spell. I'm going to type in the chat room, right? Eat more chicken. Right, the joke is the cows want people to eat more chicken sandwiches instead of hamburgers, so more cows can survive than chickens or something stupid like that. And so the cows hold up these signs to say "eat more chicken," and the letters are reversed and the words are misspelled. Right, like that's very very specific slogan is trademarked. As a matter of fact, it's it's so trademarked that Chick Fil A went all after some guy in I think it was Vermont or New Hampshire who was selling t-shirts that read eat more kale you know the vegetable kale um, and they went after this guy for copyright <laughs> for trademark infringement uh, the guy was selling t-shirts that eat more kale he was making hardly anything from the shirts there wasn't any conceptual theft because it would be one thing if you came up with a ridiculous slogan where I, this would be the worst slogan ever but like you know there's a cartoon carrot that's holding up a misspelled sign that says eat more kale okay that would be infringement because you're obviously stealing chick-fil-a's concept you're playing on that idea but it, it gained controversy a year ago because it somehow suggested that chick-fil-a owns the words eat more Right, so God, so God forbid you you I don't know, operate a, a local f farmers market and just write eat more veggies they're healthy for you. Uh, does that mean Chick Fil A is going to sue you because you dared to use the word to eat more? Um, so there's an example of a slogan that's protected not by copyright but by trademark. Um, and there are lots of slogans out there, right? I'm, I'm having trouble thinking about the, thinking of some more right now, but you see them on, on television and in print ads all the time, right? What was what was McDonald's? Wasn't there something? Uh, I love it or something like that. I'm loving it. Thank you. <laughs> you can tell how little I pay attention to commercials. Uh, 
So there's a slogan. I, I bet if you look at, at an ad, it's probably trademarked. I'm loving it. Uh, also, you know, ingredients, ideas, procedures, these aren't copywritten. Although, again, other forms do cover it. Ideas are typically covered by patents. Same thing with, with procedures. Uh, familiar symbols or designs. Depending on the symbol or design, it could, again, be trademarked. So a very, very, uh, you know, Jason's in graphic design. So a symbol or a design that's associate, associated with a specific company would would definitely be protected, protected by trademark, but not by um, copyright. Okay, let's get into the issue of fair use. Because like I said, there's a little bit of confusion here. Um, and I think part of this confusion is you go on to YouTube, which I shockingly read the other day, counts for something like 20% of all internet traffic. I, don't, I can't remember if that was in the world or just North America, but either way, that's a ton. Um, so YouTube is, is a giant, and we all know this because I bet a lot of us spend time there. <laughs> I spend most of my time there listening to music because it's the easiest way. Like, let's say a song from, I don't know, 20 years ago just suddenly pops into your head. You hadn't thought about it in years. What's the quickest way to go find it? YouTube. It's because someone, someone I'm sure has posted the... It's, it's pretty rare when I go to YouTube and don't find a song. Um, I've actually become kind of obsessed with trying to listen to um, every major song from 1930 up to the present. And even obscure songs from like 1934, someone's put up a YouTube uh, video for it. Um, so there's a lot of traffic on YouTube. My point here is that when you come to the, especially with songs, you'll see the creator of the, the video say something about fair use, right? So they put up their video for Kesha or Katy Perry or, or whoever, uh, or John Legend. Um, and there's, you know, there's the official video and then there's these videos that people create. Sometimes it just has the lyrics of the song rolling on screen while the song plays. Sometimes they put photos of the artist playing, uh, you know, working almost as a slideshow in the background of the song. And they always have this, like, fair use disclaimer saying that, oh, I can do this because of fair use. And, um, yeah, probably. But it's it's also important to talk about fair use because we see that term thrown about so much that we think we know what it means, that it just allows us to use things. Uh, but that, that's not the case. Um, so here's some, some factoids about fair use, that reproduction of copyrighted work might be, okay, so might be, considered fair within criticism, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. So if you think about criticism, that should be, that should be pretty obvious. If you've ever gone online or even on television, seen like a, a movie review or a video game review, right? The people will use portions of the thing that they're reviewing um, to talk about it. So there's a there's a classic instance of fair use, right? We're using small portions of the larger work uh, for criticism reasons. Same thing with news reporting. The exact same thing, right? You see news stories where they might be using a photo that isn't theirs, or again they might be showing a clip of a television show because such and such actress is in the is in the news recently. Um, again, they can do that because they're just using short clips in order to sort of um, embellish the the news story. Um, it's also common in teaching, scholarship, and research. So in other words, academics. Um, as a teacher, I taught Introduction to Film at one of the previous universities I worked at. Um, and we showed the whole films, okay? So it wasn't even like parts of individual films, entire films. Why could we do that? Because there was an instructional reason behind it. We weren't trying to take money out of the hands of people um, looking to, to sell DVDs or... Or, or something like that. It, it had an, an, an instructional value to it, um, and and same thing for other things. So you know, if you're writing a paper, it's perfectly natural, for example, that you might quote something. And as long as you quote it and cite it properly, you're indicating that you're just using a portion of what you've what you've looked at, um, not the entire thing. Um, again, it, it allows for kind of limited use of of, of um, content. Um, for, for reasons that are not profit-seeking. That's the best way I can put it. Um, 
second point here, fair use, uh, is any copying of copyrighted material done for a limited and transformative purpose. So there's two things there, right? Limited and transformative. Limited is just what I described, that in general, we're not using the whole piece. Okay, we're just using a part of it. Now, some of you might already be thinking, well, you were just talking earlier about the current state of music, whether it's hip-hop music or EDM music or techno music, um, right? Isn't that limited and transformative? Because after all, they're not using the whole piece of an old song. They're just using a snippet or a sample. And they're transforming it because sometimes they'll change a note or add a note or they'll change the pitch of the sample or they'll add effects to it. Right, so it seems like they're transforming it, and that's actually the the very argument that's going on right now in music, is courts have to figure out um, to what degree that use is really truly limited and transformative. Um, Jonathan says, "I'm starting to see how determining gameplay commentaries on YouTube to be non-copyrightable can get very confusing." Yeah, to switch gears real quickly to gaming, I, I think, you know, there, there's another aspect here too, which is that the copyright holder has to f be aware of what you're doing if you're using their work and has to care. So I use the example of all these people who create, you know, they they put the, the, the uh, what's the John Legend song that's like the biggest song of the year? All of, is it all of, all of you or all of me? <laughs> I forget the name of that song. But it's like the biggest song of the year, right? It's this kind of ballad. And people will create videos, uh, you know, they'll take pers you know, they'll share their personal photos of their boyfriend or girlfriend set to the John Legend song, and oh, it's so sweet. Like, technically, that's probably not fair use, because you're not just presenting the song with the lyrics on screen. You're actually taking something you created, your personal photos, and combining it with something that John Legend did. The point is, John Legend's not going to come after you, because he could, he could probably care less. I mean... <laughs> Because there's not really an impact on the marketplace by you creating that video, right? You're not taking money out of John Legend's pocket. You're not charging anything for that slideshow of your, you know, Valentine's Day weekend with your with your sweetie set to John Legend music. Okay, I mean, I guess technically maybe his lawyers could go after you, but what's what's the point? And so when Jonathan makes the comments about gameplay commentaries, that same a similar thing kind of happens where if you're creating a video game review and posting it to YouTube or you're doing what's even more common on YouTube which are walkthrough videos right you get stuck in a portion of the game and you get so fed up that you're like screw it I'm just gonna go find out the solution on YouTube um, typically gaming companies don't care about that right because after all they'd be much more concerned about pirated versions of their projects products not someone posting a walkthrough video online as a matter of fact those things kind of help the game because it creates a community it creates a buzz and the the, the gaming community is much more in support of that whereas music and film they're very much different forms where just automatic sharing is quite different after all if you post a youtube video of a, a video game review or a walkthrough that's that's quite different than being able to play the game but if you're just freely taking people's music that's different um so anyway, way back to what I was saying, you know, fair use is uh, done for limited and transformative purposes, okay? And that's kind of the area that's being argued about now is like how much is, how much can be determined limited? When does limited cross over into being too much? And to what degree are you transforming things? So back in the early 90s, Vanilla Ice had a big hit song with Ice Ice Baby which sampled heavily from a very, very recognizable piano riff that came from a song written by Queen and David Bowie. Um, and Queen and David Bowie, of course, went to court. And most of these things get settled out of court. It's pretty rare that you see something settled by, for example, the Two Live Crew story, which got settled by the Supreme Court. Most artists are settling out of court, right? Both sides reach an agreement. Um, and most artists uh, kind of understand the issue and and either pay a one-time fee, usually a pretty hefty fee, but a one-time fee uh, to be able to use, or they agree to pay royalty. So the person who helped write the song gets gets a nice chunk of money in in return. Um, but of course, that that hurts people who aren't you know like the people here. We have Alexander. We have um, 
Tarina, they're more on the music production side, but maybe they also have uh, desires to create and be in front of the the scene as well, or or or, or, or whatever. Um, I actually lost my train of thought there. Oh, because they're up and coming. It's 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 difficult to pay that one time huge fee or to pay royalties when you when you haven't found success yet. And one of the coolest things now about 2014, because we have a community that's so built upon online activity and sharing and hybrid creations, that we now have a dedicated network uh, of artists in place who do allow things to be shared and sampled. Uh, so it's 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 you know the the world has changed. So we're we're seeing more flexibility. Maybe not from the top artists out there, but but certainly there are plenty of underground and indie artists and either hip hop or techno that are that are much more willing to share beats, samples, what have you. Um, so that's good. Uh, finally, here uses such as commenting upon, critiquing, or parodying a copyright work can be done without permission of the copyright holder and be considered fair use. Okay, so this repeats some of the points. We understand that if you're just commenting on something or critiquing something, that's fair use. Parody also falls under protection. That's why all those those movies, those like scary movie things that come out every year or all the variations on it like there's one that made fun of 300 there's another one that made fun of i forget what right they can get away with that because um they're it's parody it's clearly referencing something else that's famous in the culture but it's not directly taking original stuff from it it's just kind of paying homage usually in a comical sense to that original work uh, just some real quick final points. Uh, fair use is a defense against a claim of copyright infringement. Okay, so technically it's a legal term that you would claim fair use if you ever found yourself being accused of copyright infringement. Um, if, and that's a big if, your use qualifies as fair use, then it would not be considered infringement, of course. Uh, that's a big if, and that's why I recommend that people err on the side of caution um, at this stage in your careers is probably not that big of an issue but this is why at full sale we really take a hard and fast policy on copyright um, so in this course your images and your presentations have to come from the AP images database when you get into English class with me in month four your images also have to either come from the AP images, images database or I'll show you another source later in this session where you can use images as long as you give credit for them um, and what are the chances that that image holder is really going to find out that you used an image in a project at full sale and come after you? Zero. But but still, we want to sort of lay the groundwork because you're all heading into industries that are that are going to deal with these issues. So why not teach these principles soon and get that foundation in place? Um, same thing like, uh, when, by the way, in English class, I think I mentioned this before, students finish with like um, uh, a multimodal project which is just a fancy way of saying something that's multimedia so students write a song or they create a comic or they make a short film uh, create a podcast um, and it's amazing how many times even though I scream as loud as I can like you you can't use copyrighted music you can't use copyrighted images you can't use snippets from television or film like I'll still get those projects handed in where you know a student makes a short film and what's the soundtrack the music that's being used Oh, you know, a Beyonce song or a Shakira song. And then I have to yell at the student and say, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> and again, what are the chances that Beyonce is really going to find out that some student at Full Sail used her song? But it's important to kind of, again, get these things in place early so, so people are aware of it. Uh, and finally, four issues are basically considered by the courts when it comes to fair use and here are those four factors uh, first of all the purpose and character of your use um, that's kind of what we were talking about at the beginning here you know nobody's gonna come after you for uh, creating a online review of something or um, you know something you did for scholarship or, or, or school probably uh, but if there is any doubt, like if someone thinks you're using too much of something, if you, for example, show the entire two-hour, uh, gosh, what's a film that just hit the theaters now? Hercules, right? I don't think that's going to be a big film, but that's just came out this weekend. Like if somehow you get your hands on a copy of Hercules, I don't know how you would do this, and just show the whole darn thing, and then at the end say, 
Big thumbs up. I love this movie. And then try to pass that off as a review. That probably won't hold up to fair use. Uh, so again, we determine the purpose and character of your use. Uh, the nature of the copyrighted work. We've kind of covered that as well. Um, the amount and substantiality of the portion used. So again, we touched on that kind of already in passing. Um, in general, the courts have been leaning toward what's called the heart and soul of the original work. So it doesn't matter if you're just sampling something that's only five seconds from a song. If that five second sample is so recognizable that you know, right, that, that it kind of forms the heart and soul of the song. I gave the example of Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby. I mean, that sampled a very, very short pattern, but was absolutely associated with the previous hit song. Um, a similar thing happened in the early 90s with MC Hammer's uh, You Can't Touch This. By the way, I'm, I'm sorry for such old, old references. Um, it's just that these were kind of famous at the time because this is when these were the first encounters in some ways with pop with popular music sampling things. It's not that sampling hadn't occurred earlier in popular music, but really the emergence of um, hip-hop specifically, but other music forms as well, made it so there were considerable sums of money being made and that's usually what triggers these sorts of lawsuits in general nobody cares if there's no market impact um but people do care a lot when it starts making money because obviously if they're making money on something that you created that's um <laughs> jonathan says he gets the references okay good yeah, MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This took a, a very, very familiar riff from uh, the Rick James song Superfly. And that was another thing that was headed for the courts until they decided to settle out of court. Um, so I mentioned these early 90s songs, not because I'm stuck in the early 90s, but because there were a lot of sort of like uh, big stories that happened. The Two Live Crew one being perhaps the biggest. And I should mention, the reason Two Live Crew kind of won that Supreme Court case was because their line that sort of played on the Roy Orbison song Pretty Woman was considered parody, but parody within the larger commercial song. Um, it's a little bit difficult to explain, but it sort of kind of fell into a weird sort of crack that allowed it to be viewed in a, in a different way. But for the most part, the, the, the courts have been pretty strong in support of the copyright holder. And as I mentioned, it's pretty standard practice that you get what's called uh, getting a song cleared, right? Getting clearance for the song before you begin recording. Um, so all the the names that are out there, uh, right? So Kanye West, when he samples like from a Curtis Mayfield song, he has to get that cleared in advance, and you know whoever he's sampling from gets paid a certain amount. Um, this is all pretty much standard and done ahead of time, just so you don't have to face the legal situation. Because who wants to take on that legal challenge? Because even if you win, you might lose with the amount of money that you'll have to pour into a lawsuit. And finally, the thing I've kind of mentioned in passing is the effect of the use on the potential market. Um, again, nobody really cares if you're not making much money from it. Uh, or when I give the example of the YouTube thing, right? I, I think people are sometimes creating content that probably isn't technically fair use. But again, who cares? because nobody's you, you're not impacting John Legend's market his profitability uh, by putting together your, your goofy YouTube video um, same thing with like uh, just common sense things like you know you, you're you're loud as a bar band or uh, you know if you go up one night with your acoustic guitar on the coffee house stage you're allowed to cover other people's songs <laughs> you don't have to worry about someone's lawyer coming on stage to serving you papers um, that also applies to big name acts um, you know, there's there's no rule against singing someone else's song. But if your version of something or if your use of something has an ability to be, to, to to generate profit, then yeah, pro people are going to start caring. Um, so that's a that's part of the thing it's used to. Um, how can affect affect a potential market? Now we're going to shift gears and talk about some other things that are kind of related to copyright. These are actually things that you should draw upon to avoid copyright trouble. The first is what's called Creative Commons. Creative Commons is an actual name of an organization. It's a nonprofit devoted, um, let me move my panel so I can read it, to expanding the range of creative works available to others to build upon legally and to share. Um, 
and the Creative Commons was invented to create a more flexible model, um, one that replaced all rights reserved with some rights reserved. And I also touched on this kind of tangentially before, which is that we live in a world now of so much sharing, right? There's always a share button somewhere on whatever story you read or whatever file you come across. We're just a sharing culture. Um, because we live in that kind of culture where we're constantly not only sharing things but working with others often across long distances it seems kind of ridiculous that we don't have a system in place that's a bit more flexible um, that allows us to take advantage of things that can make our web pages our facebook posts our documents our schoolwork, what have you look a bit more snazzy without getting nailed for copyright infringement or again probably you won't literally have a lawyer coming after you as a student for copyright infringement but you know god forbid you fail the class for plagiarizing right there has to be a more sensible middle ground that allows people to take advantage of a variety of tools but do so legally and that's what creative commons uh, seeks to do right i'm going to switch gears and go to the creative commons website real quickly Okay, so it's just creativecommons.org. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay, so if we go up to the top and click on licenses, you can see all the different types of licenses that are available that you can apply for. Um, and they range from the least strict, starting up here, to the most strict, which is down here. So if we just look at the least strict, and let me see if I can make this bigger. That's as big as it will allow me. Okay, so the, 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 the broadest or most permissive is just attribution. This license lets others distribute, remix, tweak, and build upon your work, even commercially, as long as they credit you for the original creation. Um, and it, then it goes on to say what I just mentioned, that this is the most accommodating of license offered. So this is the one that allows you to do anything. So let's say it's an image. You can do whatever you want with it. You can send it to others. You can change elements. So you can drag it into Photoshop and do whatever you want to it. Um, you can use it within your own work, your own project to make it richer. And you can do so for money, right? You can then turn that, use that uh, to, for, for a commercial uh, venture and, and make money from it. Okay, so there's low, no limitations, except that you do have to give credit to the original creation. Um, if we switch to the most strict, you'll see that it has very, very firm rules in place. Uh, this license is the most restrictive, only allowing others to download and share them with others. Okay? So this one allows you to download and send it to other people, but you can't do anything else with it. Um, and you can't change them anyway or use them to make any sort of money. And the rest of the codes, if you're ever interested, you can kind of read on your own because the rest of the categories fall just somewhere in between. Uh, but that's interesting. And let me give a real life example of what I'm talking about. Oh, there's a red panda. Isn't that cute? Uh, most of you guys have heard of Flickr, right? The photo sharing site. Flickr is cool, but actually what I like more is this Flickr tool called compfight.com. I'm going to go ahead and type that in the chat. Because uh, if you come to English class, you're probably going to hear it again. This is what we always recommend. Because this is a Flickr search tool. So let's say the, my, my presentation for today is actually just words. I frankly had a busy day so I didn't have time to spruce, spruce it up with pictures but you've known from my past presentations that I use pictures uh, let me see if I can find one of the ones I used in the last session let me just type in students and of course now and what we get here are a bunch of images and it's a little bit difficult to explain, but we're already in the Creative Commons area. Here, let me make this bigger so you can see the menu items. Uh, technically, we if we should click on commercial. It's a little bit hard to explain, but because Full Sail is a for-profit school, uh, commercial is probably the best one because it means that when we choose an image that's allowed to be used, uh, we're technically using it in a commercial setting because Full Sail is for-profit. Um, and basically anything above this dotted line you have to pay for, okay? So why do that? Don't do that. That's terrible. Never pay for anything. 
Uh, but if we go down below, I don't know how many of you remember last week's session, but I actually used this photo right here. Okay, so when I click on it, you'll see, look, some rights reserved. And that's why I like Comp Fight, because it, it, it searches through Flickr to find only those things. The problem is that in the past, students would go to Flickr, and then they'd say, oh, well, this photo looks great. I guess I can use it. And no, it was one that said all rights reserved, which they, they shouldn't be using. Um, and then it's really easy. Uh, this is the full code that you can embed in your HTML. I usually just go in and find the URL. This is the URL that will take me to the exact file and give information about it. I'll show that in a second. And then I can do, you know, my typical things. I can click on download. It will download the photo for me. And then I can drag it into my PowerPoint presentation. And all I have to do, and let me go back to PowerPoint real quickly. Oops. Let's pretend my PowerPoint slide here has a photo. All I have to do is, you know, paste in my photo credit. Ah, well, you get the idea. I typically like to make them smaller so they don't take up so much space. All right, drag it wherever you want, and boom, there's your photo credit. Um, so this is a really, really cool site because I like Comp Fight because it's, um, it has better photos than AP images. The problem with AP images is that all those photos were taken for news stories. So some of them aren't really as pretty as like this picture here. Um, so Comp Fight is a great way to kind of, uh, spice up your, your presentations or your other kinds of projects. Uh, but this is a good example of Creative Commons, right? All these files that I'm looking at are some rights reserved, not all rights reserved. So as long as I'm giving credit to the person, uh, right? It says paste this HTML onto your web page to give credit. As long as I'm giving credit, I'm covered. So that's awesome. So there's Creative Commons in real use. Uh, okay, we're getting near the end of the session here. Uh, real quickly, a couple other terms I wanted to find. Royalty free. This is one of those terms that confuses people because you see the word free and it sounds, oh, that's awesome, free stuff, except this is the opposite of free. Um, royalty free means that when you want to use specific media, it can be anything from music, graphics, photos, like those photos that we just looked at where I said don't don't grab anything from Comp Fight that's above that dotted line because you have to pay for it, that's a royalty. Okay, So any media that you use that requires a one-time fee, uh, Basically, once you pay that fee, then you can do whatever you want with it, even seek profit from it. Uh, but you have to pay that one-time fee. Uh, that's what royalty-free means. Instead of paying ongoing payments to someone, which is what royalties are, so if Kanye West samples a Curtis Mayfield song, he'll pay royalties to Curtis Mayfield or his, his family, right? And those payments will be ongoing. Uh, but royalty-free means that in place of that, you just make a one-time payment. Um, that fee can be very cheap. So those photos we looked at, I think they're like a dollar for some of them if you want to use those photos. Um, on the other hand, if you're a major, major artist and the other party who holds the copyright has agreed to a royalty-free use of the song, you're probably going to pay that person a huge chunk of money for that one-time fee. Um, and second, that's subjected, uh, subjected to the associated guidelines. Uh, the user of the purchased material can use said materials many times as she wishes, okay? Including for for-profit projects. So once you pay that one-time fee, you can use that image or sound file as many times as you want. Again and again and again in different forms. You can make money from it. You can do whatever. So that's royalty-free. Um, so royalty-free isn't really free, but public domain is free. Okay, that basically when copyright protection ends um, and is not renewed, the work enters the public domain. Um, so basically like really old songs from like 1910 or late 1800s or novels, right? If you want to go read, I don't know, uh, let me think of something. Oh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. It's free everywhere online. Like you can find it in 10 million forms. Forms you can download directly to your computer. Forms that you can read online. Why? Because the copyright has expired. And those, those, uh, those uh, works have entered the public domain. When our, this country is founded, the original po copyright period was, I think, 28 days. In the 1950s, it doubled to 56. It later increased even more. 
Um, and now we've gotten into a really kind of ugly, kind of weird situation, mostly driven by Disney, <laughs> because Mickey Mouse was due to expire uh, about a decade ago, I think. And they actually lobbied Congress to extend the duration for copyrights so that Mickey Mouse could survive until... I think he's up to expire in... Oh, gosh, was it, is it 2018 or 2023? But anyway, it's coming up, right? And the, the question will be, will Disney try to lobby Congress again? Um, it's, not just, it's not just Disney, the, the Gershwin family. Um, I think there's another powerful entity. There, there, there's some people who just don't want these copyrights to expire. Um, but in theory, they're supposed to end after a period of time. So basically any media created before the 1920s is generally in the public domain. That might not be entirely useful, useful for you, but it could be. I mean, if there's some really, really old photo that you want to use in your, you know, your literature or your graphic design layout somehow, you can do so. I don't know why someone would sample a song from like 1915, but maybe you would. Um, you can do so. So be aware of that. I mean, probably most of you won't spend much time in public domain, but it's worth uh, checking out, especially if you're a musician. Like, I play piano, so you can sometimes find, like, free sheet music because it's public domain. Anything by Mozart or Beethoven or not even just classical, but jazz from the late uh, 19th century, it's all free. Like, cause nobody owns the copyright to that anymore. Um, so public domain is really cool if you want to check it out. Lots of free stuff. Okay, any questions? I'm starting to lose my voice. I feel like I, again, rushed through a lot of that. I know that's a lot of information. More information that you, than you'll possibly need. But the important thing here is just to have a general sense of copyright and fair use and what these things mean generally. Because, again, we're trying to kind of teach this both when you enter Full Sail and you'll get hit with it again and again throughout your studies here. Um, as I've mentioned in other sessions, you know, the sharing world that we live in, awesome. But it's also made people get a little bit too loose with what they can use and what they can't use. So this is, uh, this is really meant to kind of make you more aware of this, okay? Um, if you don't have any questions, you are free to go and enjoy your evening. And watch the Tampa Bay Rays beat the Milwaukee Brewers, all that good stuff. Okay, bye, Trina. I'm going to stop the recording now. Let's see.